Every single year, the average GPA in MCAT that gets accepted to top medical schools increases. Schools like NYU have an average MCAT of 521, which is a 99th percentile score. Why is this happening? And can we, the lowly average pre-med, ever have a chance at getting into medical school? The answer is yes, and it is not only by improving the strength of your resume. I believe you can earn higher stats, and it is not as hard as you think. Here's our three-stage process, planning, executing and feedback on exactly how to do that. First, why are scores increasing every single year? Part of it is that pre-meds are just becoming better students. More and more people are understanding the science of learning, the act of learning, the space repetition, the Feynman method. The difficulty of the tests are not keeping pace and so those scores are going up and up and up. So if other students are earning higher stats, can you do the same? I think so. And the first phase of protecting your GPA is planning for it. For one, you can strategically put off harder classes until after you apply to medical school. Look, you don't need to take that class on Shakespearean analysis before you submit your application. That class has 7% A's and medical schools don't care if you have it on your transcript or not. They will care if you have a C plus and your GPA drops precipitously. Another huge planning strategy is making sure you choose the right major. Don't choose bioengineering, a notoriously hard major with an average GPA of like 3.2, especially because you think medical schools will think it's really impressive. There is not a single medical school in the nation that would find a 3.2 GPA in bioengineering more impressive than a 4.0 in biology. That's phase one planning and setting yourself up for success. And outside of planning is execution. Even after you've planned your courses and selected the best major for yourself, you still need to sit down, you still need to study, and you still need to do well on those exams. First, you must learn and implement evidence-based study strategies. The biggest misconception here is that studying is fueled by motivation. Unfortunately, while it may feel great to give your 120% at 3 a.m., many studies have borne out that your retention and your performance on those exams ultimately suffer. And how you feel after a study session is not what we care about. We care about the score and the performance. That's the ultimate metric. Studying should feel simple. Studying consistently should be boring with no fancy apps or some secret technique that no one has ever heard about. Practice active learning. Do more practice problems. Learn spaced repetition and do it consistently. Study without your phone in the room. Sleep at the same time and wake at the same time every day. If you take these core principles that have been scientifically borne out to help with retention and help with student performance, you will realize just how powerful these simplest concepts can be. I've done more videos in the past on in-depth study strategies. And if you want to get into the nitty gritty where I've dissected these evidence-based approaches, you can find them here linked in these videos. So let's review some core concepts to execute the best studying techniques. First is spaced repetition. This is based off of Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, which hypothesizes that information is lost over time if there's no attempt to remember or retain it. Spaced repetition strategically has you recall the information just right before you were about to forget it. This reinforces and strengthens the memory, and eventually you can gradually increase the interval at which you practice recall. You can do this with study schedules or tools like Anki that automate the scheduling for you. Second, active learning. This utilizes the testing effect by which you actively try to recall and apply information rather than passively absorb it. This can be done through flashcards, practice problems, self-testing, or teaching others the same concepts. And this is opposed to more passive forms of learning where you're rereading your textbook chapter with a highlighter in hand, just really trying to passively absorb the information. What's really happening is you're getting bored, getting sleepy, you forgot what the last three sentences said, even though you've reread it three times now, and no learning is being done. Third, there's interleaving or mixed practice. Here, you're mixing up different topics during your study session. This helps you with problem solving skills and blending together of interrelated concepts. Those are the core concepts in the execution phase of study. And outside of the planning and execution phase, there's the feedback phase. Once you complete a quarter or a semester, you will get your grades back and you will be able to correlate your performance with how well you studied that quarter. So take a close look at your study habits. 
Did you meet your goals for the quarter? If so, what can you do better so that you can actually lower the time you have to study and still get that same excellent result? If you didn't do so hot, ask where in your study habits you were weakest. This will help you get to your grade goal specifically with your specific issues and as quickly as possible. This phase, the feedback phase, is the most important because learning how you best learn is a constantly iterative process. And with our mentorship program, we help pre-meds at every stage do just that, plan, execute, and get feedback and iterate on their learning, iterate on their MCAT, iterate on their extracurriculars and letters of recommendations. If you'd like to learn more about how to optimize every part of your pre-med application, click the link in the description box below. So it is true that your GPA is not the only thing that medical schools look at. There are times in the admissions process where your GPA is totally irrelevant. And in fact, adcoms will be blind to it. They won't actually know what your GPA or MCAT score is. And of course, there are real pre-meds with 2.8 GPAs that get into medical school every single year. So yes, it's not technically the only thing that matters. That being said, too many pre-meds underestimate just how important a strong GPA is. For the majority of pre-meds, a lower GPA will sink you. And if you truly can't get it to the point that you need it to be when the time comes, consider taking the time off to do a post back or do a special master's program to show medical schools you can handle the rigor. Alternatively, there are still ways to give you a fighting chance at an acceptance. Do extremely well in the MCAT. Focus on making a large impact on your extracurriculars. Build strong relationships with faculty members and earn really strong letters of recommendation letters. Holistic admissions means that everything counts. And while yes, it is possible to get in with a 2.8 GPA, possible is not my favorite word when we're talking about your doctor dreams on the line. I prefer to be much closer to the word probable or likely acceptance. And if you're just not ready because your application is just a hair too weak, that may be your sign to take a gap year and strengthen the parts of your application that are weak. Apply when you're ready. And readiness certainly includes your GPA. I hope this video helped. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.